make sure that we separate a couple of things. Land is the surface that we work with. Real estate is the land and everything that's permanently attached, trees, houses, whatever. I want to make sure we know the difference between real estate and real property. Real property is the land, the surface, and everything permanently attached, but also it has to do with that bundle of rights that we have. The bundle of rights are so critical in the system that we deal with. We have air rights, we have surface rights, and we have subsurface rights. In addition to our air rights, surface rights, and subsurface rights, we also have water rights. I want you to remember the difference between the two. There's two water rights that we deal with. One is riparian and the other is littoral. A good way to remember the difference is that riparian are rivers, are those flowing bodies. Littorals are lakes, are those more tidal bodies. They both have to do with the restrictions that we have with any property that abuts these waterways. Um, in most cases, it has to do with jurisdictional issues. For instance, in most of your uh, bays and your gulf, the state of Florida owns the waterways. And so it's a jurisdictional issue. Regarding property, uh, real property versus personal property, I've always said if something's been screwed or glued, it's got to be real property. But that's not the real test. And I think from, from our standpoint in real estate, when we're selling real estate, we are selling real property. That personal property is not part of the transaction. And so therefore, when we're dealing with personal property, we have to separate it out. Uh, let's go ahead and define what that personal property is from a legal determination. First of all, the intent of the parties is one of the things that we look at. The method of attachment is another. Agreement by the parties. In my opinion, any time that a buyer and seller or landlord and tenant can enter into a contract, that's usually going to trump everything else. And then the last thing is the adaptation of the item. In other words, how is it, how is it part of the property? Those are some of the things that we look at to determine if something is either real or personal. Regarding basic property rights, this is where we're getting down to that bundle of rights. And there's an acronym that we use for that bundle of rights. Deep C, D-E-E-P-C. That is disposition, enjoyment, exclusion, possession, and control. Those are the bundle of rights that we have to real property. Now let's talk about the two types of estates that we have. We have freehold estates and we have non-freehold estates. A freehold estate, an easy way to remember it is, this is ownership. And there's only two ways that we can own real property. 99 and 44, 100% of the time, it's going to be in a fee simple estate. And that is to say we have our full bundle of rights. The other way that we can own real property is going to be something called a life estate, where something is missing. Let me give you the best example of a life estate. I gave my father a little house in East Hill in Pensacola, Florida, and I gave it to him in a life estate. My dad can do anything he wants to with that house. It's his. I don't own it. He does. But as part of the agreement, when my father passes away, that house is going to revert back to me, which means that I am a reversion estate. I have an interest in the property. When my dad passes, it comes back to me. Now, had I decided to give that to a third party, uh, that would have been something else. Uh, that would have been a remainder estate. And let me also say this about a life estate. You can tag it to anybody's life or death. It doesn't matter who it is. It doesn't have to be the parties involved. So we have a fee simple, which is the most common, but we also do have that life estate. And the reason that the life estate is, is missing something, we don't have the ability to, to let it be inherited by somebody else. Uh, it's going to go back to someplace else. Uh, as far as the non-freehold estates are concerned, non-freehold estate is less than ownership. A good way to remember this is that it's some type of a leasehold estate. Probably the most binding uh, non-freehold estate that we have today is something called an estate for years or tenancy for years. This is the, it is the most binding because, first of all, uh, it has a beginning date, it has an ending date, and it's in writing. And this particular state cannot be broken by either party unless you breach. So if a, if a property sells and the landlord decides that the new owner of the property says, you know what, I want that old tenant out, if they have a tenancy for years, you can't break that lease, no matter if even if property transfers to somebody else or not. 
A tendency at will, however, is missing something. The tendency at will, the most common, is a month-to-month -month renter. In other words, you have a beginning date. It may be in writing, but you don't have an ending date. One of those three components is missing. Now, if you are a month-to-month -month, uh, tenancy at will, the landlord only needs 15 days to evict. In other words, they can give you a 15-day notice for the eviction period. If it's a week-to-week -week tenancy uh, at will, all that's required is a seven-day notice. The last and the least of all of the non-freehold estates is a tenancy at sufferance. A tenancy at sufferance is somebody who's merely a holdover. That's somebody that's still there with no agreement of any kind, whether oral or in writing. Regarding the homestead and what that's about, not all states, by the way, have homestead uh, requirements or homestead rules. The state of Florida does, and there are a couple of interesting points about the homestead and the way that it works. Uh, to begin with, in a homestead, it protects a spouse whether they have title or not. In other words, if I'm a single person uh, and I have title in my name and then later I decide to get married, uh, my new spouse, even though her name may not be on the deed because she now is part of that homestead that I own, has equitable interest in that property. And by the way, I can't sell my house without my spouse's permission. So it protects that spouse in, in terms of of uh, being disinherited. Uh, also, we have some homestead tax exemptions that we deal with. So the homestead has a lot of good benefits to it. Uh, it's primarily when we're dealing with uh, within the city about a half acre and outside the city 160 acres. The types of real property ownership are also going to be important. Uh, there are several of those. The first one is the estate in severalty. A good way to remember this is that you are severed from others. In other words, it's sole ownership. It's individual ownership. One of the most common that we deal with in Florida is something called a tenancy by the entirety. The tenancy by the entirety is a husband and wife ownership. In other words, it's the marriage that owns the property. Nobody owns it uh, separately. It's an undivided interest, right, and use with an automatic built-in right of survivorship. And, the, and the, uh, it's very similar to the joint tenant, but in the state of Florida, joint tenant is not used for husband and wife. In a joint tenant, you have the right of survivorship, but it has to be stated. But what you have with a joint tenant is you have equal interest, rights, and use. In other words, 50-50, a third, a third, a third, a quarter, quarter, quarter. It all has to be bought at the same time on the same deed, the same conveyance. The tenant in common may or may not have equal interest rights or use and may not have been bought at the same time. If you are a person who is a joint tenant and one of those people want to sell their interest, they can certainly do that. Whoever that new person coming in, they, are, they can't be a joint tenant. They can only be a tenant in common because they did not take title at the same time everybody else did. Therefore, that new person does not have the right of survivorship. Regarding condominiums, cooperatives, and timeshare, I think this is pretty much what made the state of Florida famous, isn't it? Let's start out with condominiums. Um, a condominium is individual ownership in a multiple unit dwelling. Uh, it's, a, it's a common practice today, but in order to create a condominium, what you have to do is you have to file with the Department of State and go contrary to common law because basically what you're doing is that you're eliminating airspace or air rights that you have and also subsurface rights that you may have. Now, the cooperative, on the other hand, the cooperative probably came about a lot in terms of time before the condominiums did. In a cooperative, what you're doing is you're buying shares of stock in a corporation that owns a building. So there's no disturbance of the air right or the subsurface rights. And what you do with a cooperative is that you enter into a proprietary lease for your particular unit. So a cooperative is, is ownership in a corporation, different than what a condominium is. I think the important issues that we need to deal with here is that as a licensee, when we're uh, helping people buy and sell condominiums and cooperatives, there is a rescission period that we have to be very aware of. For both of these units, if it's a brand new condominium or cooperative, a buyer has 15 days after they enter into a contract or receive the appropriate condominium or co-op docs to change their mind. In other words, to rescind. 15 days to rescind. If it's a resale on a used unit, 
that individual has three business days to rescind or change their mind. And I think it's important to note that it's from the time that they either enter into a contract or receive the proper condo or co-op documents, whichever comes last, that's when the meter starts to run. Now, what's a timeshare? A timeshare can be a combination of a couple of things. It could be ownership or it could be a rental type of situation. There's a rescission period if it is an ownership. The rescission period for a timeshare is going to be 10 days from the time that they make the purchase. So their rescission period is a little bit different, but they still have that rescission period. And that's about all we have for that chapter. I'd like to do now the review for that chapter. In Chapter 4 Review, real property is the land and everything attached and that bundle of right. Personal property may become a fixture through either the intent of the parties, the method of attachment, agreement, or adaptation. The bundle of rights includes disposition, enjoyment, exclusion, possession, and control. To own real property or real estate in fee simple or a life estate are the most common, and actually the fee simple is the most common. The homestead is protected against judgment foreclosures, uh, and also remember it also protects a spouse in terms of inheritance. A tenant by the entirety is between the husband and wife. A joint tenant is equal possession, interest, time, and title. The acronym is PITT, P-I-T-T. -T. Condos and co-op rescission periods, 15 days for new units, and also three business days if it's a resale. And the rescission period for a timeshare is going to be 10 days. Water restrictions include littoral and riparian rights. The life estate terminates when someone dies. The acronym for our bundle of rights, again, is DEEP C, D E E P C. Disposition, enjoyment, exclusion, possession, and control. A tenant for years is a non freehold estate that has a beginning date, an ending date, and is in writing. A tenancy at will, a good example, is a month to month renter. Remember that there's a 15 day notice for eviction. The tenant of sufferance, however, is simply a holdover with no agreement whatsoever. And that's the end of that review.